Good morning. We shall discuss electromagnetic waves in today's lecture. Let us start our discussion with the question is light a particle or a wave? <coughs> now, let us so is light particle or wave. In order to address this question, we should first be clear as to what we mean by a particle and what we mean by a wave. How are these two different? So, a particle as uh, we have we know a particle is something which occupies a, which you can find at a point at a given time. So, to describe the position of a particle you need in three dimensions you need three coordinates x, y and z and if you specify the x, y and z corresponding to a particle you have told precisely where the particle is. So, once you have specified the position you know exactly where the particle is and the particle is there and nowhere else. And if you specify x, y and z as a function of time, you then have specified the complete trajectory of the particle. So, now once you have done this, you know exactly how the particle moves as a function of time and at any given time you expect to find the particle only at one point. Now, unlike this, so this was a particle. So this is a particle. A particle is to be found at a given at a particular position at a un, at a given time and nowhere else. Unlike this, a wave. And we have discussed a plane, sinusoidal plane wave. A wave fills the whole of space. So you have a quantity a, which is a function of x, y, z, and time. So at any given time instant. You could ask the question what is the value of A here or what is the value of A here and A is something which is distributed over the whole of space at any given instant of time. It could have value 0 somewhere or it could have a finite value somewhere. Nevertheless, it is defined everywhere through the whole of space at a given instant of time and as time evolves, as time progresses, this A the dependence on x, y, z changes. So, it is there defined over the whole of space. And you can ask the question what is the value of A here, what is the value of A here and what is the value of A here at different positions at the same time. So, the a wave is something which is extended which exists over the whole of space, a particle is something which is, has a unique point at a given time it exists only at one point. So, this is one of the main differences between a wave and a particle. Now, let us ask the question is light a wave or is light a particle? Now, <clears throat> consider a situation where you have a light source. So, you have a source of light which emits out light. So, the light comes like this and you put an object in the path of the light. So, this is the light and then you have a screen over here. So, the question is what will happen? in this situation. So, I have a light source which emits out light. The light comes from this source. So, this is my source and I, ha I have an obstruction, an object over here and this is my screen and light comes from the source and falls on the screen. Now, the question is what do we see? So, this is a situation that we encounter quite often and what we know, what we observe in such a situation is that on the screen you will get a dark patch which is the image of the object as it were and the rest of the screen is illuminated. Now, if you try to model this situation, so let us try to make a simple model by which we can understand this situation and the simplest possible model would be that light comes out from the source 
as some so light is some particles which come out from the source particles which impinge upon this object which encounter the object don't pass through particles which don't encounter the object pass through so the part of the screen a part of the screen is illuminated and another part of the screen has no light falling on it and the particle having no light falling on it you see the shadow and you can this is a, this the predictions of this model correspond to what you actually observe so you have the corpuscular or the particle theory of light which was in vogue at newton's time so you could start off by saying that light is a particle but if you look closely at the shadow so if you look very closely at the shadow at shadows in general you will find so if you look at a shadow in the vicinity of the edge of the shadow you will find bands of bright and dark lines so somewhere over here in the vicinity of the shadow you will find something which looks like this there will be bands of bright and dark lines and these lines are prominent if you have an object which is quite small how small we shall discuss as we go along in this course it will such a such a thing will be hard to see in this particular situation but there are situations where at the edge of shadows you will find bands of bright and dark lines there are situation there is another situ possible situation let me explain that to you suppose you take two of your fingers and put them very close to each other and look at the sky in the daytime when the sky is illuminated by sunlight you will notice very fine bands of very fine bands of bright and dark in the space between these two fingers so you have to make sure that these fingers are very close together but there is still a small very small gap you can then notice a very <coughs> fine set of bright and dark lines which go through your which uh, in the gap which exists between the two fingers there are many experiments like the newton's ring and so forth all of which cannot be explained so this bright and dark bands at the edge of the shadow which i just talked about these the bright and dark bands which you get if you look at the small gap between your fingers newton's rings which you can observe in the physics laboratory and a large variety of such observations cannot be explained unless you postulate that light is a wave it is now well known that light is an electromagnetic wave and in today's lecture we are going to deal a little with little bit with what we mean by electromagnetic waves to be more precise we are going to ask the question how are these waves produced what are the equations governing these waves etc so let to give you a little bit of uh, okay so we could start off this question of electromagnetic waves Uh, the issue of electromagnetic waves by again asking a question so the question that we are going to start with is so let us take up a question and the uh, the question that we are going to start our discussion with is as follows the situation that we are going to discuss is as follows there is a charge q located over here and there is a point p a distance r away from the charge <coughs> so we have a charge q and there is a point p a distance r away from the charge let us ask the question what is the electric field at this point p that is produced by the charge q over here so we would like to calculate the electric field at this point and we all know that you could apply coulomb's law to this situation coulomb's law tells us that the electric field at the point p is minus q divided by 4 pi epsilon into e cap r d 
divided by r square. So, this is Coulomb's law, the law of electrostatics, which is familiar to all of us. And Coulomb's law tells us that if I have a charge Q at rest over here, the electric field it produces at a point P, which is the distance r away, is given by minus Q by 4 pi epsilon naught E cap r. E cap r is the unit vector which points from the point where you wish to calculate the electric field to the position of the charge. So, E cap r is the unit vector pointing from the point P to the position of the charge. So, the electric field is in the direction of E cap r, but it is has a minus sign. So, it is actually oppositely directed divided by r square. So, the electric field falls off as 1 by r square. So, you essentially have an electric field which points like this and it falls off. This is the electric field E. So, let me overwrite with blue. This is the electric field E and it points away from the charge and it falls off as 1 by r square. So, this is Coulomb's law. It tells us the electric field at this point P and Coulomb's law is quite uh, well known. So, I am sure all of you know all about it. Unfortunately, Coulomb's law is not precisely valid. In the 1880s, so in 1880s, let me put down the year roughly 1880s, somewhere in the 1880s, a British scientist J. C. James Clerk Maxwell. proposed certain changes in the laws which govern the electric field and uh, which uh, so so the changes also imply modifications of the coulomb law coulomb's law and uh, these modifications proposed by james clerk maxwell in the 1880s had profound implications for the electric field and the magnetic field produced by charges and the electromagnetic wave is a consequence of these changes proposed by Maxwell. The changes proposed by Maxwell go by the name, the final equations proposed by Maxwell, which were proposed by Maxwell, go by the name of Maxwell's equations. In this course, we shall not be discussing Maxwell's equations. We shall discuss the consequences of Maxwell's equation uh, to the problem which we are now studying, that is the electric field produced by a charge. So, let us now address the same question. What is the electric field produced at this point P by the charge Q taking into account the modifications of the laws of, electro of, of electricity and magnetism proposed by James Clerk Maxwell. Well, <coughs> so the law proposes certain modifications and uh, the first modification, one of the big consequences uh, one of, uh, is, is also a problem of the Coulomb's law. We all know that no signal can propagate faster than the speed of light. Now, Coulomb's law, if you look at Coulomb's law, so let us look at Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law tells us that the electric field here depends on the distance to the charge and it is directed away from the charge. Now, let us consider a situation where I move the charge a little bit. So, if I move the charge from here to here, there would be a change in the electric field at this point and Coulomb's law tells us how to calculate the new electric field and the change in the electric field here would occur instantaneously. It would occur at the same instant of time that you move the charge from here to here. So, Coulomb, according if, if Coulomb's law were strictly correct, then the electric field here would change the moment you move the charge over here. Now, this would be against the accepted fact against the hypothesis that no signal can be propagated faster than the speed of light. And it is now an observed fact that you cannot actually propagate, send any signal faster than the speed of light. So, if you cannot send, if, if you, if, so the fact that you cannot send signals faster than the speed of light and Coulomb's law are in disagreement with each other. So, you have to either abandon this hypothesis that you cannot spend, send a signal faster than the speed of light or you have to abandon Coulomb's law. And it so happens that the 
the modifications proposed by James Clerk Maxwell lead to a modification of Coulomb's law, which take in which incorporate the fact that you cannot send a signal faster than the speed of light. <coughs> so, let us now write down the modified electric field. So, let me again draw the picture first and then write down the, uh, the modification that occurs in the electric field. So, the picture is that I have a charge over here, the charge is Q and we want to calculate the electric field over here at the point P, which is a distance R away. So, let me write down straight away the electric field at the point P at a time t that is produced by the charge Q. So, the electric field is given by minus Q by 4 pi epsilon naught. We now have E cap R prime by R prime square plus R prime by C D by D T E cap R prime by R prime square plus 1 by C square D square by D T square E cap R prime. So, this is the expression for the electric field at the point P as predicted by Maxwell's equations. Let me now explain to you the various terms in this expression. The first thing which you notice is that instead of the distance r to the charge, we now have a new symbol r prime. So, let we have this quantity r prime, which is different from r. Now, as I just told you, a signal cannot propagate instantaneously from the charge to the point P, where I want to calculate the electric field. So, now if you want to calculate the electric field at the time t, at the time instant t at this point, the electric field at the time instant t should not depend on the position of the charge at the same instant of time, it cannot because that violates that is contradictory to the fact that a signal no signal can propagate faster than the speed of light than a fixed speed which is the speed of light. So, the electric field here at a time at this point p at a time t should depend on the position of the charge not at the same time, but at some earlier time. And you have to look at the position of the charge at an at so you have to go back in time by the amount light of time light takes to propagate from the charge to this point where I want to calculate the electric field. For example, we know that the sun is at a distance of 1.5 into 10 to the power 11 meters. So, the sun let, let us just do an estimate the distance to the sun is 1.5 into 10 to the power 11 meters and if there is some electrical distance some electron on the sun does something funny just move around 
then it will take a time it will take the time this divided by c the speed of light which is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second which gives us 0.5 into 10 to the power 3 or 5 into 10 to the power 2 500 seconds. So, if you are interested in the electric field produced by some electrons on the sun and we are interested in the field measured on earth by that. So, the electrons are on the sun and we are measuring the field on the earth. So, if I measure the electric field on the earth now, I should look, I should be looking at, I should be concerned with the position of the electrons not at the same instant, but at an instant which is 500 seconds earlier. So, the electric field here due to electrons on the sun will depend on the position of the electrons on the sun 500 seconds earlier. So, you should be looking at, so if I want to calculate the electric field at a time t on the earth, you should be looking at the positions positions of the sun of the electrons on the sun at a time 5 minus t minus 500 seconds. And this is what is called retarded time and the positions of the electrons at this retarded time at, at the time instant in the past when the signal left the electrons is called the retarded position. So, the thing to bear in mind is that R prime refers to the retarded position of the charge. It is not the charge, the position of the charge at the same instant of time which you wish to calculate the electric field here, but it is the position of the charge at a previous instant of time which takes into account the fact that light takes a finite time to propagate from the charge. The signal takes a finite time to propagate from the charge to the point where you wish to calculate the electric field. It cannot propagate instantaneously. So, R prime is the retarded position. So, the electric field over here depends on the retarded position of the charge and the simplest thing which you could do this would be to modify Coulomb's law. So, as to incorporate the fact that signals cannot propagate instantaneously and replace the position r and the unit vector E cap r with reference to the retarded position E r prime and the first term in the expression over here is precisely this. <coughs> so, the first term over here is just the Coulomb's law where the position of the charge has been replaced by the retarded position of the charge r prime. But this is not the only modification that occurs in the expression for the electric field. There are two more terms which occur. So, let us look at the two more terms. So, I have we have one more term here and one more term here and both of these are new things which come about because of the modifications in the laws of electricity and magnetism proposed by J C Maxwell which are incorporated in the Maxwell's equations. <coughs> Now, you should note that these two new terms come into the picture only if the charge is moving. They involve time derivatives of the position of the charge and the unit vector to the position retarded position of the charge. So, you have time derivatives and these time derivatives are non-zero. This time derivative and this time derivative, they are non-zero only when the charge is moving. So, you have these modifications of Coulomb's law which come up when the charge is moving. Now, <clears throat> let us look at these new terms one by one. So, the second term has the first time derivative of the 
of the position. So, it is effectively a time derivative of the Coulomb's law which comes over here and you have to multiply it by r by c. So, this has the same dimension as this term and you have the time derivative of the position. So, this term comes into the picture the moment you have a moving charge. So, if you had a charge moving with a uniform velocity, uniform speed, then you would have a contribution from the second term. Whereas, the third term would contribute only if you had accelerations because it involves the second derivative of the of quantities which refer to the position of the charge and this will be non-zero only if the charge is accelerating. So, this, so, the first new term arises if the charge is moving also if it accelerates, but the second charge is non-zero only for a charge which is accelerating. A charge which is not accelerating and moving with the uniform speed will have only a contribution from this and this not from this. Now, <coughs> radiation is something which can is an electric radiation is an electromagnetic effect. So, it is a effect of electricity and magnetism which can propagate over large distances. Another point which I forgot to mention earlier is that the modifications of the laws of electricity and magnetism proposed by Maxwell. So, these new equations of electricity and magnetism proposed by, proposed by Maxwell had another very profound implication. They showed that electricity and magnetism are manifestations of the same underlying quantity. So, you now have a unified theory of electromagnetism. They are not distinct phenomena. Electricity and magneti magnetism are essentially manifestations of the same phenomena of the same thing called electromagnetism. They are not distinct and uh, it is a unification that you have and Maxwell's equations, they, this unification essentially follows from Maxwell's equations. So, Maxwell showed effectively that they are the same electricity and magnetism are just two aspects of the same thing. Okay. And uh, <coughs> the magnetic field predicted by Maxwell's equations, let me also write it down here. So, the Maxwell's equation also predicts a magnetic field which is given by B which is at the point is minus E r prime cross E t by c. So, this is something I should have mentioned earlier, uh, I, I forgot to mention it. So, Maxwell's equation predict that the electric field here due to a charge here is given by this expression and the electric and the magnetic field at this point is given by this expression. So, the magnetic field is the unit vector to the retarded position of the charge cross the electric field divided by c with a minus sign. So, so if you wish to calculate the electric and the magnetic fields at this point due to the charge over here, you have to you can calculate the electric field from this expression and you can calculate the magnetic field by taking the cross product of the unit vector towards the retarded position of the charge with the electric field. So, the electric field and the retarded position of the charge together determine the magnetic field also. So, once you know this you can essentially determine the magnetic field also at this point. Now, we were discussing the electric field in some detail and I told you that this term is the same Coulomb's law with the retardation taken into account. This term arises when the particle is has a velocity and this term arises when the particle has an acceleration. Now, radiation, the phenomena of radiation, in the phenomena of radiation, you have charges at great distances influencing charges, other charges at uh, charges influencing us. So, you have two charges at great dis distances influencing each other. We could go back to the situation of the sun, charges on the sun, charges which are moving around on the sun produce electromagnetic radiation. 
which we see here. So, charges moving around the sun on the sun influence charges on the earth and the light that we see is essentially this. So, there are charges inside my eyes which get influenced by charges moving around on the sun and this is the how we see essentially how we see the light from the sun. So, this is the whole thing. So, radiation is something which can propagate over large distances, it is an influence which over large distances. So, we have to see terms in this expression for the electric field which will be significant even at large distances. The Coulomb's law notice falls off in the predicts that the electric field will fall off as 1 by r. Now, this is not the term which leads to radiation. So, radiation does not arise from these 1 by r square depends. So, radiation is not the 1 by r square part of the electric field. Radiation arises from any 1 by r dependent term if at all it is there in the electric field. So, if I had a 1 by r dependent term in the electric field, this would be something which falls off considerably slower than the 1 by r square term in the electric field and this is the term which is responsible for radiation. So, if I had a 1 by r term in the electric field, this would be the term which would be responsible for radiation. If I did not have such a term, there would be no radiation and the reason why we can associate this with radiation, we shall, shall be clear in the next class when we discuss the power which is radiated. So, <clears throat> the question is under what situation will there be a 1 by r term in this expression for the electric field. 1 by r square term does not contribute to radiation and it is clear that the Coulomb's law predicts only a 1 by r square term. You can easily verify that if I differentiate this expression for this expression over here. So, here I have the unit vector to the retarded position divided by r square. If I differentiate this with respect to time and then multiply by r the retarded position distance by c, this again is of order this again is of order 1 by r square and this does not contribute to radiation. It is only this term over here which has a 1 by r which can have a 1 by r dependence and it is this which gives rise to radiation. And this term has a non-zero value only when the particle is accelerating because it has a secondary weight with respect to time. So, the point is that you have radiation only when you have an accelerating particle. So, let us now look at this term which is responsible which can give rise to a 1 by r term which is what we call radiation. Let us look at this term in some more detail. So, the term we had over there is d square d t square of the unit vector to the retarded position of the of the charged particle. So, to let me draw the picture again, this is the charged particle, this is the point where we wish to calculate the electric field and we have to calculate the retarded the second derivative of the unit vector to the retarded position of the particle. Now, we could this can be written as d by d t square uh, by r square by r rather right. So, this could be written that side I had the correct thing. So, this can be written as a second time derivative of the vector to the retarded position of the particle divided by the magnitude of that r prime. Now, this evaluating this expression in general is a little complicated 
and the complication arises because of the following when the particle moves from here to here let us say then you have to also change the expression for the retarded time because the retarded time depends on the distance to the particle. So, you have to take into account the change in the retarded time when if the particle moves from here to here the distance to the particle from the point p has changed and that will affect the retarded time and the retarded position both simultaneously. Now, you could make a simplification if you assume that the motion of the particle of the charged particle is restricted to a small region over here such that the dimension of this region that this region inside which the particle moves is much smaller in extent compared to the distance r. So, we are interested in calculating the electric field here and we are going to make a simplifying assumption. We are going to assume that this distance r is much larger than the distance over which the charged particle move. The charged particle moves only over a small extent. For example, going back to the electron on the sun, the electron on the sun does motions on the surface of the sun. The radius of the sun is 10 to the power 8 meters and the electron on the surface of the sun, let us assume that does not go all the way around the sun, it does motions which are restricted to a part of the surface of the sun and the distance to the sun is 10 to the power 11 meters. So, the assumption that the extent of motion of the electron is much smaller than the distance from the earth to the sun is quite valid. So, this is the an example of the assumption which I am going to make. So, we are going to assume that the charged particle moves around, it does accelerations, but the motion is restricted to a very small region and the point where you want to cal calculate the electric field is much further away than this extent. In this assumption, you can hold the retarded time, you can calculate the retarded time using this fixed distance r and this simplifies matters quite a bit. So, when you want to calculate the electric field at a time t over here, the retarded time that you use is t minus r by c where r is now the distance to the center of this region. You do not take into account the fact that the charged particle moves around within this region which will change the expression for the retarded time that is neglected because it is a very small change and we are going to use this exp expression t minus r by c for the retarded time. Here note r is the distance from the point p to the center of the region inside which the particle moves around. With this simplification further this is one of the simplifications further we are going to assume that when you differentiate this twice. So, you are going to we have to differentiate this expression twice. If you differentiate the denominator twice you will get a term which falls off as 1 by r square which is not the term of interest. <coughs> so, the term we are interested in is going to be where you differentiate the numerator twice or you differentiate the numerator and the denominator once. Well, the term that we get finally is approximately the acceleration. If you differentiate the position vector twice, you get the acceleration divided by r and we are again going to assume that as the particle moves around in the denominator, you can replace r prime by the position to the center of the of this region over here. So, it is the accel retarded acceleration, it is the acceleration at the time t minus r by c. Now, if the charged particle moves in the direction of this line of sight, it does not change the unit vector. There is a change in the unit vector to the charged particle to the retarded position of the charged particle only if the charged particle accelerates in the direction perpendicular to the line of sight a a an acceleration over here in this direction an acceleration in this direction will not cause any change in this term. So, this does not contribute. So, we have to look 
at only the acceleration perpendicular to the line of sight perpendicular. So, it is only this acceleration which contributes to this term, it is this only this acceleration which changes the unit vector. So, if this is my unit vector, if the particle moves from here to here, there is no change in the unit vector. The unit vector changes only if the particle moves from here to here. So, it is only the perpendicular component of the acceleration perpendicular to the line of sight component of the acceleration which produces any effect on this term. So, it is only this that has to be taken into account and if I put this back into this expression, we then have the 1 by part 1 by r part of this electric field that is the part which we call radiation. So, let me write down the 1 by r part of the electric field. So, we have E t is equal to minus q by 4 pi epsilon naught c square r into a perpendicular t minus r by c. <coughs> so, let me again recapitulate what we have done. I told you right in the beginning that the modifications of the law of electricity and magnetism proposed by James Clerk Maxwell, if you incorporate those, the electric field due to a charge is given by this expression over here. When you are interested in radiation, you have to isolate the part of the electric field which falls off as 1 by r as you move away from the charge. The part which falls off as 1 by r square or a larger power of r does not contribute to radiation. So, we have seen that it is only the last the third term here which contributes to radiation. So, the radiation occurs only when the particle is accelerating. We calculated this term under the simplifying assumption that the particle's motion is restricted over a very small region. In this assumption, we then calculated this second derivative of the unit vector and putting it back into the expression, we obtained the electric field produced by the charge part accelerating charge particle to be this. So, this is the radiation part of the electric field which corresponds to radiation, this is the radiation part. <coughs> Let me summarize this again. So, there is a point P here, there is a charge which is accelerating in this direction and we would like to calculate the electric field produced by this charge accelerating in this direction, the charge has got a magnitude q accelerating in this direction a, we would like to calculate the electric field produced by this over here. So, if you wish to calculate the electric field produced by this accelerating charge at this point, you have to first take the component of the acceleration perpendicular to the line of sight. So, this is the direction perpendicular to the line of sight. So, you have to take the component of the acceleration perpendicular to the line of sight which is this. So, the electric field over here is equal to minus q by 4 pi epsilon naught c square r into the component of the acceleration in this direction. So, let me in this direction over here. So, the electric field over here will be parallel to this and there is a minus sign. So, it will be directed opposite. So, this is what 
the electric field is going to look like. It is the it is parallel to the component of the acceleration perpendicular to the line of sight. It is directed in the opposite direction and it has a magnitude given by the expression over here. You could also write this E t is equal to minus q by 4 pi epsilon naught c square r a perpendicular t minus r by c into sin theta, where theta is the angle between the line of sight and the direction line of sight is here and the direction of the acceleration. So, you could also write the electric field as minus q by 4 pi epsilon naught c square r into the perpendicular component of into the acceleration, there is no need to put the perpendicular component anymore into the retarded acceleration into sin theta, where theta is the angle between the direction of the acceleration and the line of sight. <coughs> so, in the past say uh, past few minutes of this lecture, I have told you how to calculate the part of the electric field which corresponds to radiation, we have, I have told you how to calculate this from an accelerating charge. Let me now take up for discussion a practical application of this. So, let me show you the situation which is the practical application of this. We have two metal wires, one like this and one like this. Let us call this A and B. These two, but you can think of it as one single metal rod which has been cut in the middle. These two parts of the rod are connected to a voltage generator. So, I have two metal rods you can think of it a line like this. So, you can think of it uh, there are two metal rods one is A one is B and the tips of these the two tips which are near each other are connected to wires and these wires are fed into a voltage generator. This voltage generator produces a time dependent voltage. So, uh, alternating voltage. So, let us consider a situation where at a given instant of time this is positive and this is negative and ask the question what will happen. So, if I have a positive voltage here to this end of the rod metallic rod, then all the positive charge will accumulate at the other tip and the negative charge will rush over here. Similarly, the negative charge over here on this rod will accumulate on the tip over here and the positive charge will rush onto the other end. So, if I apply a voltage like this, there cannot be a voltage gradient across inside the metallic wire on the surface of, so the charges will go to the tip. So, when I put a positive voltage here, there will be a positive charge accumulated at this tip. If I put a negative voltage here, there will be a negative charge accumulated on this tip. Now, the voltage source is varying with time. So, if I have a voltage source varying with time, then after some time this will become negative and this will become positive. When this becomes negative, so now it, ha it was earlier positive, it has now become negative, then the positive charges from here will rush on to the other wire, other end and the negative charges from here will rush here. So, you have the charges, the, the electric essentially the electrons will jump back and forth between these two rods. And if the electrons jump back and forth between these two rods through this because of this voltage oscillating voltage, you will have positive and negative charges alternately accumulated over here. This you will have charges accelerated charges going back and forth in this direction. So, if this has a length L, You can think these two metal rods as a single metal rod of length L and you have charges accelerating back and forth that 
two ends between the two ends of this metal rod. So, you have a situation where you have charges accelerating in this direction, in the direction of this rod. Now, if you are interested in the electric field pattern at a large distance from this uh, arrangement over here, then you can think, uh, so that is the first thing and if the time it takes for the charges to move from one end of the rod to other, so the time scale at which the charges are moving back and forth, if that time is much larger than the time it takes for light to propagate this distance. So, if the time scale over at which the charges are moving back and forth is much larger than the time it takes for light to propagate across this rod, if this condition is satisfied, then far away from this contraption, we can think of this as a as an oscillating dipole. So, this is what is called an electric under these conditions, this is what is called an electric dipole oscillator and you can think of this as an oscillating dipole and this kind of an oscillating dipole. So, inside this oscillating dipole I have charges accelerating back and forth and this kind of an oscillating dipole where you have these charges oscillating back and forth will produce electromagnetic radiation, it will produce a radiating electric field and the radiating electric field there will also in addition to the radiating electric field there will also be a magnetic field, there will be a magnetic field given by this expression because of the accelerating charges. And this kind of an oscillating electric dipole, uh, the radiation it produces is called the electric dipole radiation is very common in a large number of uh, technological applications. So, whenever this is one of the simplest mechanisms to produce electromagnetic radiation and uh, not only that, much of the radiation produced in nature is occurs uh, through electric dipole radiation and uh, in the next class, uh, we shall discuss the electric dipole radiation, the radiation produced by such an apparatus in somewhat more detail.